We're going to speak about the expert group meeting of the Global Land Indicators Initiative today. And you represented UN Habitat at this meeting two weeks ago in The Hague. What was the purpose of this meeting? Why is UN Habitat involved? The meeting was one of the series of consultations that uh, UN Habitat and the Global Land Group Network have established about two years ago in partnership with the World Bank and the Millennium Challenge uh, Corporation to, to, to seek to get more consensus, build harmonization around the land indicator work. So the first meeting took place in Naples in last year, then the second one in April uh, this year during the World Bank Land Conference. And this, this was the third meeting that took place to actually go down and identify selected indicators that can rally all partners or all actors working on land. And in that context, uh, the, the post-2015 development agenda came to forth and they tried to service that particular initiative. Why is it important to push on developing global land indicators and for whom? Who's gaining from this? First, there's no kind of comparable data or information on land indicators. So different partners are going there, trying to do different things, different methodologies. So it was felt that it's important to harmonize at least the way in which data are collected, the way in and some, what are the core type of land indicators that all of us uh, working in the land sector and the other stakeholders can understand and make use of it. So it was important to to actually get that one. Who will benefit? Everyone, everyone working on land or has some relationship, you and I, uh, with land, will benefit in ensuring, for instance, that uh, whatever tenure arrangements or security that you may have can be said that. So that's the bottom line. And uh, since also coming within the development agenda, the global development agenda, it will be beneficial for countries. Uh, civil society, academia, development partners uh, to rally around that type of uh, issue. I want to bring in a little bit other people that don't know too much about indicators. Well, maybe you can give one or two sentences on why indicators are not just theoretical stuff. Where do they become very tangible for people that work on land, but the real people working on land, what <laughs> the policy wants? One of the key issues that uh, you may know is uh, in some countries uh, the, the issue of land grabbing, which is the translation of uh, insecurity of tenure. So ensuring that there is a adequate protection of rights uh, of people who are using the land is so critical. So for them, it'd be very good to have a, a global um, standard or platform on the which uh, they will rally, they will know that they can Call upon to protect uh, some of their legitimate or legal rights. So it's a, it's a far-reaching uh, impact. It could be conceptual, it might be perceived as so, but when it comes to development actions and agenda, it becomes very concrete and operational. Now, the expert group in their meeting that we just spoke about proposed four land indicators for consideration by the member states and development actors in advance uh, on the post-2015 development agenda, uh, perceived tenure security, secure land rights, equal rights for women, and legal recognition of a continuum of land rights. And how did the group reach uh, this agreement, and why exactly these indicators? Now, why this one? Uh, first, we are building on some of the, the consensus that have been uh, you know, dealt with before. Uh, the legal uh, dimension was in the Rio Plus 20 outcome document, so we build on that, and everyone knows that without any legal or governance structure or framework, it's very hard to enforce anything that can, can come about. The uh, tenure security dimension is really about the legitimacy, how people perceive. You may have all the, the, the regulatory framework, but if people are not uh, feeling secure, it might not be that effective. So to balance the outcome with um, the type of processes and the legal framework that we have. So we build on those processes, and in the doc in the um, in getting to the consensus, consensus, we have some documents that we put on the table. We had a framework that we have been working on, uh, MCC, the bank, and uh, UN Habitat, with the support of the Global Land Tree Network. Just briefly, who are your targets for your advocacy? So far, we 
try really to get a kind of consensus within land stakeholders who have been participating in this process. So that was one of the key things that we tried to achieve. Now, moving forward and looking into the post-2015 development agenda, for instance, the next move is really to ensure that member states who will ultimately make the decision, and I'm talking about some, some who have a bigger stake, could be the United States, the European Union, Africa group, or, you know, and the group of 77 plus China. So some of these actors will be the next target to ensure that Yet there is a broad consensus that is emerging and that it, they will be part of it. Obviously, as usual, the case with, with meetings like this, not all the um, actors were part of the meeting. So there is complementary work that's been done somewhere else. How do you plan to incorporate their work into your proposal or the overall uh, uh, road ahead uh, framework and, and do, avoid duplication? How do you pull that together? We have to reach out to other communities, development communities, beyond land community, for instance. So that's very important. Uh, we also we are aware of other processes that are ongoing. And we have been fortunate to be also involved in somehow in those processes. We also know that each organization uh, that attended that meeting was somehow involved in other uh, you know, land indicator development. So we tried to reach out to them by uh, sharing what came out of that, uh, the, the, the EGM, and also trying to bring uh, what is also emerging from those processes into, this, uh, into what we are also proposing. More importantly, you will know that uh, we try to keep the, the process open. Uh, the proposed indicators are just proposed indicators, and they may evolve, and that's why we are also reaching to the European Union to get feedback, and ask uh, those who attended the meeting to reach out to others who might be interested to provide inputs. So by December or so, we may come up with a, a set of indicators that might not be necessary, the exact wording as uh, initially stated, based on the input and uh, insight that we will have received so far. Final question here. You are also a member of the platform's Global Donor Working Group on that. And uh, what role can this group play, especially in advocacy, to support the inclusion of global land indicators in the post-2015 development group, especially the role of the donors? For us, it's, uh, it's one of the key players. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was, we were talking to the land community, but the donors ultimately have to, at time, look at the cost of uh, you know, collecting or making that data available. And in that way, we are the last uh, global donors meeting uh, at the margin of the, the CFS. We, we, we presented the, the initiative, and in any global, land, uh, global donors platform, we try to use that opportunity to rally the donors behind some of the things that they also feel will be important. So their views really matter. And their support is really to, to make sure that they, whatever is proposed will also be of use, of interest to them. So getting their view will be very important. And in terms of advocacy, uh, many bilateral donors are, uh, will be there in that decision moment uh, coming next year. So by embarking them earlier on so that they can talk to them, I mean, interact with their partners either in New York or those who have been negotiating so that they are well aware of what we will be proposed in that particular area will be very useful. So for donors to actually relive, um, relay with their counterpart with their, within the country and other partners as well, because when they reach out to other development partners, it adds more weight and reduce the, the time for negotiation. So for us, it's uh, building this consensus uh, as broadly as possible. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.